The views expressed here are not necessarily those of the management. And to those of you who have heard some of the examples or some of the theoretical points, I apologize beforehand. Uh, it is not so easy to bring new examples every time. Anyways, as I see it, family therapy, or more generally speaking, interactional therapy, is actually merely the expansion of um, the, the existing concepts of therapy to a new viewpoint that has gained, of course, very large acceptance and attention in other fields of research and scientific endeavors. And that is to say that the moment one no longer focuses the attention to an individual organism, natural or artificial, one is then faced with phenomena which uh, remain either outside the frame of reference or, or of observation or otherwise force the observer to attribute to the individual organism certain properties which the organism may not have. In other words, um, this sort of thing that one then observes is, uh, I think, very well described by the biologists if they talk about the emergent quality. Or, if you prefer, it's a kind of a gestalt, which comes about, as I said earlier, as, as a result of the interaction between the organism and the larger surroundings, the environment it is in. Uh, Economists, inter interesting enough, were very, um, very early already realized this interdependence of the organism and the environment because they, as early as the 1920s, talked about the fact that one cannot understand the, the economic behavior of a large group of people, say a whole nation, by first studying the economic behavior of an individual and then trying to make from there conclusions, to draw conclusions about the behavior of the society. They very early drew attention to the fact that one cannot derive valid conclusions from what they called a Robinson Crusoe society composed of one person. Now, what I mean when I say that in the interactional approach you look at more than just the monad the individual, and you then are faced with phenomena that are uh, new, essentially new, is um, perhaps exemplified by a rather well-known example that somewhere in northern Canada there is a region where the foxes show a very regular, very periodic increase and decrease in their numbers. In other words, the fox population shows on a kind of a sign curve over a period of four years, first an increase to a certain peak number, but then a, a decrease to near extinction and then a rise in their population again. Now, there is nothing in the individual fox nor in the species that would account for this periodicity. If an observer limited his uh, attention only to the foxes, it would be necessary then to ascribe to the individual or to the species certain properties like, um, I'm not trying to be facetious, but one could say perhaps there's a death instinct or something else. But of course the moment the attention of the observer is expanded to include the immediate context in which those foxes live, then it is found that the foxes live almost exclusively on wild rabbits and the wild rabbits on the other hand have hardly any natural enemy except the foxes and it is then seen that the wild rabbits also undergo a similar kind of periodicity except that the peak and the low point are displaced so that the rabbits have a curve that is 
the opposite of the sine curve described by the Fox population. And now, of course, we have the answer to what, if one remained monadic in one's observation, would be a mysterious thing, i.e., naturally, the more foxes there are, the more rabbits are eaten, so that the rabbits reach near extinction. In the meantime, of course, food becomes scarce for the foxes, and they in turn begin to decrease, thereby giving the, the rabbits a chance to multiply and um, su survive and multiply again. Uh, another example, again it may be known to you, bear with it, um, is the study carried out by anthropologists either during or immediately after World War Number 2 in Great Britain. They, uh, I don't know how this study came about, all I know is that Margaret Mead apparently was in on it, and the study, um, whether this was the extent of the study or not, I don't know either. But in any case, the study, among other things, investigated a uh, rather curious phenomenon. It had been found that American troops stationed in Great Britain had uh, the opinion that the English girls were rather fast or sexually forward or what you want to call it. And that on the other hand, uh, sorry, and uh, investigation or um, sampling and, and, and large-scale sampling with the girls on the other hand showed that they had the similar opinion of the soldiers. And this is where the, the mystery began because uh, if the girls had said, well, the American soldiers are terribly slow or something, then it would have made sense. But it didn't make sense because uh, both parties said about the other that they were, that they were uh, sexually very forward. So they made this study and they compared courtship patterns in the English and the American culture. And they found that the two cultures have um, both something like 30 discrete steps in their courtship patterns from the first meeting until the consummation of sexual intercourse. Except that those various stages, those 30 discrete stages had a different order of sequence in the two cultures. And they also found that kissing in the English culture comes relatively late. Let's assume on step 25. And that uh, in the American culture it comes relatively early. Let's assume at step 5. And you already can guess the outcome, of course. It is that um, the moment the American soldier rather innocently started kissing his girlfriend, she was faced with a what for her was rather forward and um, inappropriate behavior because she felt cheated out of something like 20 steps in what quite unconsciously for her was proper courtship behavior while the American soldier was now faced with um, an alternative, either of uh, two alternatives rather, either of which seemed inappropriate. Either the girl would indignantly uh, reject him at this moment or she would practically get ready for sexual intercourse because from 25 to 30 there isn't much left as you can easily imagine. So here again, if you want to study the individual engaged in this kind of interaction in isolation, you find of course that you're faced with a behavior for which there is no obvious reason. If I uh, carried things to the extreme, I could say that it would be possible for instance to ascribe to the girl uh, some label like either a uh, hysteric reaction or uh, psychopathic behavior depending on whether she rejected or jumped into bed. But in either case, um, we are faced with something that taken in isolation seems to be pathological. A third example are the famous, famous Ash experiments you may remember that Ash exposed uh, groups of six to eight college students to a very simple experiment in visual uh, discrimination. And what he did was he showed the groups two or sets of two cards each. And on one card, there was just, there was just one vertical line, but on the second card, there were three vertical lines of different lengths, and all the students had to do was to indicate by voice which of 
uh, the, the, the lines were of the same length, where obviously these two would be of the same length. He had his students seated in a single circle in front of his desk. And this is where the interesting thing comes in. The first said six students. Eight, the last student, the eighth student, had all been briefed before then. They weren't really subjects, they were stooges. They had been briefed to give unanimously the wrong reply, starting with card number four. The seventh student was the real subject. He had not been briefed. And again, it's easy to imagine that faced with this situation, he was in the dilemma because his senses told him, but of course these two lines were of the same length, but the enormous group pressure of the preceding six students and their unanimous wrong response created for him a context in which he had to decide if he wanted to rely on his own perceptions or if he wanted to give in to the group pressure and not uh, disagree with the group. The eighth student was only put there in order to make things a little more, uh, to conceal the actual arrangement a little better. Uh, Ash found that of his seventh, of the real subject, the seventh student, 75% uh, submitted to the group pressure in varying degrees, and only, apparently only 25% had the guts to maintain or to stick to the, uh, their own perceptions in spite of this massive group disqualification. Some of them did it rather easily, others, these subjects were of course intensely uh, interviewed after the experiment, others did it with quite a considerable sense of anxiety, some even referred it a feeling of depersonalization. And again, the experiment seems to prove, at least to me, that if you look at the behavior of the subjects in isolation, if you apply the monadic view, you could conceivably attach to this behavior some kind of labor, a reality dis uh, the distortion of the reality perception or something of the kind. And those of you who heard Babelas last year, or was it this spring, I forget, talk about his experiments, uh, in which again he had set up very, very intricate, very interesting interpersonal contexts, the rules of which were unknown to the subjects involved, will remember how also those subjects behaved in a way that viewed in isolation could almost be called paranoid. Now, so much for my contention that, as I said, as I said at the beginning, family therapy is the introduction of the idea that if you look at interaction, if you look at individual behavior in the wider context in which it occurs, brings to the fore certain phenomena which can, which it is difficult to explain, either in the monadic view or which forces us to attribute to the individual mind certain properties which the mind may or may not have. Now, needless to say, the Inkle of this interaction, or rather almost synonymous with the term interaction, is the term communication. Communication is to be taken not only as verbal behavior, but of course as all behavior. Um, I think it is safe to say that all behavior is communication in an interpersonal context, because even silence, as you well know from the behavior of the catatonic patient, is of course some sort of a communication. And even if somebody drops dead to the floor and lies there motionless, he still uh, greatly influences. He communicates something which greatly influences, of course, the behavior of others. So I would like, uh, this is open to criticism, but I would like to suggest for the purposes of my talk that we consider all behavior that occurs in an interpersonal context as communication. Now, uh, communication is a somewhat um, wide term. It covers too much, and I would like to be a little more specific 
um, basing myself on Morris and his um, idea of semiotics, the science of language. I think that the field of communication could be subdivided in the same three sub areas that Morris proposes for um, semiotics. Morris says, we first of all have an area that we call syntactics. And this is the area where you look strictly at the relation between signs. You are not interested in the meaning of the sign. You are only interested in the relation that exist, uh, exists between signs. Now, if you think, for instance, in semiotics, of course, you talk mainly about words. Therefore, the study of syntactics is, in a way, the study of those strings of words, of the relation between words that are admissible according to the code, the matrix of the language, and others which are not. You can take the idea of syntactics into the field of telecommunications, and then you're concerned with statistical properties of language, which the idea, with, with problems of transmitting information, etc. This is the field of syntactics. A telecommunication engineer, just like the the main study in syntactics is not, or at least not primarily interested in the meaning of science. He's interested in the relation in statistical properties of science. Meaning, of course, is on the other hand the concern of semantics. Semantics studies mainly what a given sign has by way of conventional agreed upon meaning. And there's a third area that Morris calls pragmatics. And by the pragmatics, Morris means the effect, or the relationship rather, between the user and the sign used. And I think that the idea of pragmatics could be expanded in communication theory to study the <laughs> behavioral effects of communication. In other words, while Morris is uh, in his uh, basic uh, writings only goes to the point where he says pragmatics is a question of sender, signed relation, or side receiver relation, I propose that we say that pragmatics in general, in other words, the sender receiver relation by medium of, or through the medium of, a sign, be it the spoken word, be it the, be it the gesture, or, as we shall see, also the context plays a role, is the field that we are mainly interested in when we talk about interaction and the communication in the sense that it, it comes up in family therapy. Now, this does not mean, of course, that the other two areas have no importance, especially semant the semantics, of course, is of great importance, but more important than the actual content, as I hope I'll be able to show, is um, the form of communication and the behavioral effects that communication has. So, in the field of pragmatics of communication, we talk mainly about relationships and the way relationships change over time. And this brings me to the next point, unless you have any questions. I would like to go step by step, and if you have any questions, then train them up immediately so that we can then go on. All right, as one looks at behavior, one can say that people who interact exhibit or are engaged or are staying inside a stream of events. Let's assume there's a person A interacting with a person B, that we then find that A does something indicated here by this little dash, and then B does something else, and then A does something, and B does something, A does something, D does something, and it goes on like this over time. Now, um, if I may be a movement, if we may concentrate on a few research aspects, I think you will readily see that what you read in many, many books and articles on behavior in the widest sense, in the behavioral sciences, is um, the following. An interaction is established. Now, this may be either that you 
make a laboratory animal behave in a certain way, solve a certain task, or it may be a doctor patient interview, or it may be the observation of what a child, how a child behaves and how his behavior changes over time. But whatever it is, this kind of a stream is first artificially induced, I mean experimentally or in the course of a conversation. What is done next, in the most traditional way, is that this behavior here now, let's assume A is the subject and B is the interviewer or the experimenter or the psychiatrist or what. If you simply say, you simply now make a cross-section of behavior A, of A, and you eventually come up with a sigma something. That is to say, eventually, out of this behavior of A, some common characteristics are extrapolated. Some kind of an average is computed, but some kind of a, um, some kind of variables are extracted, and they are called, then within this view, sigma A, in other words, somehow the behavior of this uh, person here. Now, this is, to my mind, a rather dangerous thing to do, because you first finish up with something that is highly abstract. And the question is whether it really reflects any kind of a important characteristic of the person's behavior. But what's more, of course, is that it really completely disregards the interaction with person B. Person B is treated as if he weren't there. And I'm going to read to you for a moment something out of a recently published book from Pathological Normal Language, which I think shows very nicely the kind of problem you can run into if you engage in this kind of cross-sectional average averaging of behavior. Uh, below, um, I'm reading from, from uh, an uh, excerpt from this book. Below are reported some fragments of a therapeutic interview with a schizophrenic patient, in which the patient used gibberish, alternatively with more recognizable but still inco incomprehensible language. The patient, a man of southern European descent in his late 30s, had been in treatment for over six months. His talk had been characteristically rapid, difficult to follow, repetitive and abstract. In one session, the therapist, responding to the rambling remarks of the patient, began to make such statements as, Do you know that I have difficulty understanding what you are saying? How is it that I don't understand what you are saying? Could it be that you are afraid of me? What are you scared about? Do you think I mean to hurt you? Do you think I don't care for you? You think I'm angry at you for something you did? Towards the end of the session, the patient began to deny that he knew anyone of his name, whereupon the therapist responded by saying, Shake my hand. I want you to know I'm here. The exchange was, uh, was then as follows. Doctor, come on, shake it. Patient, I don't shake a hand. Doctor, taking patient's hand. Oh, you're leaving, it, you're leaving your hand limp in my hand. Patient says something that isn't quite clear. I don't have any idea or something like this. The doctor, I'm not letting your hand get away until you shake it. Patient, well, believe me. Doctor, what shall I call you? Patient, I'm a very smart fellow. I don't twist in the, the same way twice. Believe me, I'm a very different type of fellow. Doctor, what shall I call you? Patient, you can call me by name. We have enough of them. And if we move that way, we... Doctor, what's your name? Patient, well, let's say you might have thought you had something there before, but you hadn't got it anymore. Doctor, I'm going to call you a dean. At this point, the patient walked out of the room. Rather understandably. Uh, now, see, in this, in this um, presentation here, it seems to me this mistake is being committed. The doctor somehow seems it, it is, seems to come through between the, the lines, seems to think that, of course, he is the sane one. He is somehow a neutral entity that has nothing to do at all with the behavior of the patient, and the patient is sick and therefore exhibits behavior that somehow is a result of his diseased mind. But if you take into account, for instance, in this brief interchange, 
how much interaction there actually is and how much this doctor does by way of things that could be given all kinds of uh, interpretation about the patient, homosexual or otherwise uh, masturbatory or, or what not, I think that the behavior of the patient in this sense makes, in this case, makes good sense. Now, not all studies are based on this kind of averaging of the subject's behavior alone. You can do, of course, the same thing with the behavior of the interviewer or of the experimenter, and you come then up with the same sort of thing for the interviewer. And you can say then, all right, we establish a, a relation between sigma A and sigma B, and we somehow, if they're right, come to some sort of a understanding of an essential ingredient of this interaction. However, even this view, of course, still leaves out one most important uh, aspect, and that is that there is a passage of time involved here, and that we thereby do not leaving time out, we do not realize that we are faced with something that could be called progressive change or sequential patterning of events. That is to say, if these events are interdependent, but the one preceding the other, of course, to a certain extent determines the nature of the next event, and that in this constant determination of event by event, we eventually come to a structure which is very different of any kind of averaging that may be of this kind here. What I mean by this is the following. Um, as you will know, um, in psychology, triads, are usually nowadays established. And the triad consists in the fact that if this is our experiment that here, I'll start with this event here. This event is called the stimulus, and the stimulus produces a response in the subject, and after having received this response from the subject, the interviewer or the experimenter rather, then gives a reinforcement. So we have these famous stimulus response reinforcement triads by which are not of or uh, along these lines are not of psychological research into interaction proceeds. Well you see already from this schema however that we have left out something and that is this undeniable event here or here or later here and so on. That is Really nothing but a uh, far more dull illustration of the very pretty joke of the la rat uh, that says to the other, I have trained my experimenter so that every time I press the lever, he gives me a piece of cheese. So you see, in this joke, of course, the rat has reversed the triad. The rat now sees his, what the experimenter considers the response, the rat sees as a stimulus, the reinforcement, the piece of cheese by the experimenter is then the stimulus, then this of a sensitive becomes a new reinforcement in an inverted kind of a triad. This thing here is made more than purely theoretically interesting because it is something that you can observe many, many times in couple therapy. 